Hello everyone, welcome to our Let's Play series of Disco Elysium. This is Colonel RPG as usual, and I'm very happy that you chose to join me today as we mess with the boots that we took from that corpse over there. These boots were probably left on the corpse because they were impossible to pull off while it was hanging. They're not exactly pleasant to look at right now, much less smell. I might be about to throw up. Let's look the boots over carefully. Graceful whirls cover the boot's glossy surface. These will be gorgeous once you get them clean. I'm going to look at the soles of the boots. Fairweather T500 VE is imprinted under each heel. I'm going to look inside the boots. Still, just pieces of sock and rotten cadaver. I'm going to put the, book, the boots away. Okay. Well, we got them. We got the boots. So, that's great news. We also have... Time. Wash the boots in the kitchen somewhere. In the, what do you mean in the kitchen somewhere? It's in the kitchen. It's not somewhere. It's specifically in the kitchen. And also, I'm pretty sure the cook is not here, so I'll be able to do that. Without much problem. I will. Oh, yes. This industrial gas-powered stove has been used to prepare food for many hungry hostel guests. There are several pots and pans on hand. Getting the corpse residue out of these boots is going to require patience, and also a huge pot full of boiling water, soap, and white vinegar. Let's check the cookware out. A commercial pot draws your attention. It's very large, gigantic even. It could be used to make enough stew to feed an entire city, and also to boil a putrid pair of death boots. I'm gonna murder everyone in here, because <laughs> they're gonna eat from that. Uh, I'm gonna check the cleaning supplies out. There is a variety of soaps and bleaches in the cabinet to the left of the stove. There is also a bottle of white vinegar in the cabinet next to the fridge. It's bad with those boots. Don't be stingy now. The boots are really disgusting. Pour some dish soap and the bottle of white vinegar into the pot. The delicious smells of cheap soap and vinegar waft up from the pot. All right now, chef. Light up the stove and boil them. Add water and the boots to the pot. Bring it all to a nice boil. The strong smell of vinegar forces you to step away from the pot. The water slowly comes to a boil. Wait. Strips of polymer fabric and human tissue separate from the lining of the boots. They float to the bubbling surface. Wait some more. The boots look cleaner and cleaner. Those bits of human flesh are beginning to look cooked. You can smell it too. Just like beef stew. A little more. That's it, chef. The boots are as clean as they're going to get. Steam, dense with the smell of strange meat, disappears into the vent above the stove. I'm gonna dump the sock and flesh stew and examine your new boots. A pair of real beauties. The boots are shiny, hot, and reek of vinegar. Just perfect. Master Chef out. Mm-hmm. Well, I have no idea how good they are. These greaves are light as feathers and just a tad too big for you, but don't let that bother you. With these on, you look like some kind of future warrior, and they'll keep you safe if you accidentally shoot yourself in the foot. So worth it. Uh, we get a minus one for composure because shoes too big to fill, and plus two to authority. Put your foot down. Okay, they are authority boots that I will not use at the moment. Am I still wearing my tie? I am indeed, okay. And then over here we have the quest done. All this is really good because, of course, it gives us experience, and we need that a lot. We did we did so much stuff. I mean, we are completing Monday quests. Didn't get that many Tuesday quests, but that makes sense. We, uh, Tuesday, it's still... Oh my god, I leveled up. Yes, that's nice. Okay, I thought I was going to level up again. Um, but Tuesday is still a young day. It's fine. It's good. Now let's get out of here before anybody notices, because we have... Uh, we have to talk to Joyce. Hopefully. I say hopefully because I don't know if she's going to be there. I imagine she is. So we're just sprinting along. We passed both of the checks over there. On the... Um, 
on the the things that allow you to look in the distance. Spy glasses, I don't know what they are called. The game calls them a thing, and I forgot forget what they are. Hey Joyce, what's up? Good to see you tonight. You're back. Good. She takes a sip from her silvery thermal cup. What can I help you with? I've got some more questions about reality. More lessons in basic reality? She's positively surprised. My favorite part of the day. Go ahead, ask me anything. We can do this again? With the esprit de corps? Okay, let's do that. Glad to have been of assistance. Okay, so all I need is esprit de corps. I should have some. Well, I do have some. Only the one for my RCM patrol cloak. Not too great. But we could take drugs. That'd be nice. I have a bunch of things. Yeah, it would be nice. Esprit de corps is psyche. And... Oh, I, do I need electrochemistry? Hmm. I do have a drug that brings my psyche up and my physique up. I think. Let's see. Psyche goes up. Psychomotorix. Both of those drugs are that. Speed and Preptide. Hmm. Well, let's go with the pure Holidon thing. And hopefully not die in the process. It really doesn't like me doing any of that. Okay. So it's going to be my health taking damage. But I can actually wear the Frita jacket. Oh, no. I can't wear the Frita jacket. It's my esprit de corps that's a stake. It's fine. There we go. We can buy more. We can buy more um, uh, anti-death. Anti-death supplies. It's fine. Hey, let me think of something close to me. What is... Six kilometers southwest in the Valley of Dogs. Junior officer... Chad Tilbrook takes aim at a rabid black dog licking its wounds in the grass. To his left, his partner, Emil Mullins, whispers, You heard what happened to Tequila Sunset in Martinez? Yes, he lost his mind, Tilbrook answers, fingers on the trigger. Don't worry, Emil. He pulls it out slowly. Slowly now. He'll find it again. That's us. Tequila Sunset is us. We always do. What am I? You? You're an officer of the RCM. She says energetically. The Revachol Citizens Militia? Preciso Mundo. Good. And what is the Revachol Citizens Militia? Nothing more nor less than the de facto law enforcement body of post-revolutionary Revachol, detective. You said de facto? Yes. That means not de jure. The RCM acts in what is poetically called the twilight of international law, both at the behest of the coalition government and to its chagrin. What do you mean? The RCM's responsibilities are defined by the Emergency, Wayfarer and Aliments Acts, three pieces of legislation keeping the city in a, let's be honest, laissez-faire stasis to the benefit of foreign capital. Let's be honest indeed, and let's read all four options because this is another one that, that uh, is funny to read. So I'm basically a lackey of capital. So I'm basically a thrall to foreign interests. So I'm basically one of the good guys. So I'm basically going to avoid this subject and ask the next question in this line of inquiry. <laughs> I'm going to go with the good guys because that is the moralist option. We're going to lose or we're going to gain mor uh, morale. Not that we need it, but still. There's nothing basic about your role, Detective. It's true that the RCM keeps everything the way our seemingly permanent provisional rulers like it. She leans in. And I didn't get morale. Interesting. Yet, on the other hand, I know these people. I deal with them daily. Let me tell you, dear, they are not fans of you. Why? The post-revolutionary decade was a disaster for the coalition government. Revachol in the 20s was hell. 
especially on the west side of the river. Gang warfare, a botched privatization scheme, a nuclear pile meltdown. They called it the International Zone because no nation wanted to claim responsibility. The RCM restored peace where the coalition failed. A true blue citizen's initiative. She smiles. They will never forgive you. So permit me to conclude with this. Who you are to me is the police, the only legitimate law enforcement authority in Revishol. Thank you, ma'am. And if those authorities drink so hard they need help recalling the basic terms of reality, well, I'm here to help. She bows and smiles. <laughs> now that we're alone, what is the pale? Are you sure you're sure? Your colleague seemed adamant. Yes, what is the pale? Okay. She concedes. The pale is the most dominant geological feature of the world, detective. The separative tissue between the Islers, it is the inter-Islery mass. Wait, and what is an Isla? Isla is a Mycenaean word for a continent of matter, enveloped on all sides by the pale. Also, isolation, or landmass. We used to believe there was only one. In the last four centuries, we have discovered seven. Windy, Seol, Samara, Ilmara, Grad, Katla, and this Insulinde. And Insulinde is... An oceanic isola. It comprises mostly of water. Muindi is the largest, Katla the coldest, Insulinde the bluest. What can I say? She stops. Each is perishing and dear. I don't understand fully what she means. She says that an isola is a landmass, which I find it easy to understand because isola kind of li sounds like isle or island, so it would be the landmass. But then the oceanic isola over here, it's not a landmass. It's like, it's weird. And th that is, this is where this setting gets the most of its fantasy from, is in the geographic nature of the world. Um, that's why the pale itself is a very complicated thing for me to understand it, to understand. So I, 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 I'll let you take your own conclusions out of her dialogue here, because I my conclusions are all over the place. Okay, so what is the pale like? Achromatic, odorless, featureless. The pale is the enemy of matter and life. It is not like any other or anything in the world. It is the transition state of being into nothingness. Is it here? And I'm going to look around. No, detective. We're safe. It begins there, 6,000 kilometers to the north, and even more to the south, east, and west. You are in the middle of the Isola. She points to the sea. As your gaze instinctively turns north, a small black pit opens up in your stomach. 6,000 kilometers from the end of the world. That's roughly the, the distance between the equator and the North Pole on Earth. Uh, roughly. It's, it's not too far away from that. I, th I don't actually remember how much it is. I think it's like almost 7,000 kilometers. Uh, but I might be wrong on that. Yes. That is enough. Many cities are built much closer. And, and I'm going to point north. There? An uproar of matter, darling. Rising into the pale. Rolling. Evaporating, even. A great vision. The area of transition between the world and the pale is called porch collapse. Imagine a grey coronal mist, cold vapour, marked by spores of an opportunistic microorganism, a mold that's adapted to grow at the edge of the unrest. It's... She closes her eyes and breathes out heavily. The most disco thing you will ever see. You hear your pulse rise. The air feels caustic and cold suddenly. What are its physical qualities? It's difficult to describe or even measure. 
Something whose fundamental property is the suspension of properties. Physical, epistemological, linguistic. The further into pale you travel, the steeper the degree of suspension. Right down to the mathematical. Numbers stop working. No one has yet passed the number barrier. It may be impossible. If we're surrounded by pale, how do you get from Isola to Isola? Oh, it is... Her lungs deflate. Her words sound like a sigh. So difficult for us. A squall of birds. Hardware operating in the harbor. Firm. Self-evident. It is possible to force dimensions on the pale. In modern times, we can even compress its latitude, bouncing radio waves from one end to the other, shortening the path. But it is still hard for humans to navigate the pale without getting lost, or having our minds damaged. The pale can damage the mind? Extensively. How? Some say the damage stems from extreme sensory deprivation. Others argue that pale somehow consists of past information that's degrading, that it's rarefied past, not rarefied matter. They call it the blend over of the self. The pale does not only suspend the laws of physics, but also the laws of psychology, maybe history even. The human mind becomes over radiated by past. What does this over radiation feel like? It feels terrible. Absolutely terrible. International standards strictly limit civilian travelers to six days of pale exposure per year. Uh, that sounds about right in regards to normal ra uh, ionizing radiation exposure. This feels... I've talked about this um, with other people, uh, specifically with Keith Ballard, about his interpretation of uh, of the pale. He has a let's play of, um, of the original game and a let's play of uh, the of the uh, director's cut, or, you know, the the edition that... Um, Final Cut? Whatever the newest edition is, uh, as well. But um, he sees the pale as a... as a, a metaphor for climate change and for, for global warming. Because some of these lines are very ominous. It feels like the pale is swallowing the world. And I do have that memory somewhere that the pale is closing in on us at all times. But I do have that... So basically, I have that memory of reading that somewhere. I don't remember if there's another person... I think there is another person that talks about it in the game. But right now, as she talks about it, I'm getting the impression that the pale is just... Space. It's not, you know, not not space. It's not like a word that they have for space. It is this, this world's stand-in for space travel. Uh, because, you know, traveling in space does expose you to solar winds and ra ionizing radiation as well. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to have space travel, that's going to be a thing as well in, in regards to health of uh, the travelers. So six days of pale exposure per year. You know, they have... They, I don't think they have airplanes in this setting, so the travel would be... Six days would be quite a, a huge limitation, uh, depending on how fast you can actually travel. Uh, but the thing that really... So, just to finish my point here, it does feel like the pale is just, you know, the Isolas are... This This is a fantastical setting, really weird, and nothing like reality, but this is akin to traveling through space, basically. And it's difficult, but the people do it. But, and, and that that's the point I'm trying to make. I do, I will bring uh, bring your attention to how the science of her language is all all over the place compressed latitudes and bouncing radio waves like it sounds like it's grounded in real science but then the game is okay with doing the uh, stuff about rarefied matter and rarefied past and this as somebody who i studied history and uh, in more specifically i i what i really like about history is studying the scientific development of things rather than necessarily the historical and well the, I like the history of science rather than the history of politics, uh, and uh, that's why I went into archaeology instead of just normal traditional uh, history because, you know, traditional history is just politics anyway. Uh, but uh, the history of science is full of people just having 
you know, they have to make sense of what uh, what they see in the world and stuff like rarefied past and rarefied matter. Well, I don't remember seeing it anywhere or anybody uh, s s talking about this in and or anybody specifically talking about this in 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 any of my um, uh, l looks through history, basically of of science. It does. It does remind me of, of specifically the understanding of matter is, is something that is very easy to get into and very easy to learn about the the history of the understanding of matter in atoms and stuff like that. Um, and it's easy to, to read about. And it's also easy to think that it was so long ago, but no. At the beginning of the 20th century, people still didn't know that atoms existed. At the time of Einstein's, Einstein being being like about this, this writing about his uh, theory of relativity, People were still not sure that he was right. I, Einstein was was known or was an atomist, which was a term that people used because obviously there were other scientists that weren't atomists that didn't think that the world was made of atoms, uh, which they they weren't bad scientists for not thinking that. They just ultimately were wrong, but they were they were just normal scientists that didn't think the world were was made of atoms, and in fact, there was there was reason not to believe in. Judging by by the observations, there was reason to believe that atoms were too. Um, there was, the, I get the impression. I might be wrong about this, uh, but I get the impression that people at the beginning of the twentieth century, and certainly in the nineteenth century, uh, people thought that atoms were too whimsical of an explanation, too grounded in historical perceptions and in historical um, sort of pre precedents, basically. The Greeks have, had been, and before the and before the Greeks, but the Greeks specifically had been talking about atoms uh, since back then, and people were like, ah, I was just saying that because the Greeks, the Greeks uh, talked about it. There, there probably is a better explanation for that, and it turns out it is that there is a better explanation than atoms. Atoms are an incomplete description of reality, obviously, or matter rather, uh, and so much in fact that uh, the modern consensus is that matter isn't actually a good word for describing what exactly. It is, it because it's just really it's at the end of the day it's just energy and uh, waves, energy waves and frequencies and stuff like that. It's kind of it's kind of brutal to think about it, and it, it's kind of weird. Wait, wait, you mean there's nothing solid? No, there's nothing solid. Solid is, is just a state of matter. So, for you to describe matter as solid, then you're limiting the description of matter, um, because obviously you know anything any matter that wouldn't be solid wouldn't be matter, right? So anyway. Uh, for, we tend to think of atoms as like specks of dust that you get down to it, and it's just like they're like little things, but they're not. They're just they're just energy, and it's kind of amazing to think about it like that. But either way, science science and, and when you read through the history of science, uh, you read stuff like this, like rarefied past and stuff like that, and it's I I really 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 like this because it just adds to the ma magical nature of the setting, and it's also very um, there's a word for it. Uh, I'm I'm missing the word right now. It's it's uh, believable, but although there's a better word for it, it's very believable. As in, it's realistic for them to talk like this and for her to talk like this because she's obviously like she obviously knows what she's talking about, or at least she talks like she knows. She might be full of shit right now, just saying nonsense, but and I'm just like eating it all up. But that's the thing in video games, you tend not to do that because well, the players will eat it all up, and this is canon. Joyce Messier said it. Anyway, let's continue. It's more for her, way more. Wait, oh, the the six days of pale exposure per year for the civilian pass travelers. You're not a civilian passenger. No, nameless detective of the citizen's militia. I am a member of the entrepreneurial business class. I'm cleared and trained for 22 days of pale transit annually. Someone else you've met may have been exposed as well. The strange gray-haired woman in her lorry. Oh, do lorry drivers pass the pail? Yes. Carried in the hulls of airships. She nods. It's a horrific job. Automation will abolish it soon. You should ask the pail driver about this. See what she says. That poor woman must have stories to tell, like you wouldn't imagine. Yeah. Are you over-radiated? Up to my gills, officer. What is entroponetic? Entrepreneurs. She corrects. Is the scientific study of the pale, or a recent iteration of it by way of grad. 
The study of the Pale reaches back 6,000 years. The Periconarsians called it the Western Plain. Did they cross it, the Western Plain? There are signs of pre to modern crossings. Successful navigation of the Pale relies not just on technical know-how, but intensive psychological preparation. Some of these tactics have been known for thousands of years. What has anthroponetics changed then? Nothing. We remain powerless before the Pale. The only real advance in Pale Transit is the speed with which an aerostatic craft can pierce it. Less exposure leads to less effects later. Yeah. Aerostatic craft? Hybrid airships, detective. Conventional rotors or jet engines no longer add velocity after the point of reference for motion is suspended, once you've crossed from near pale to far pale. In essence, we throw them in and they come out the other end. If we throw them precisely. If we do not? Then they don't. Of course. How much pale is there compared to the world? The pale outweighs reality two to one. There is more pale than there is matter. And the ratio is slipping. There it is. Slipping how? To our detriment or... What do you think, detective? She looks you in the eye. It's growing. There is more and more of the pale. Precisely. One of the few measurable effects of the pale is that it is expanding at an unknown rate. An intuitive conclusion of that development is that one day the pale will cover everything. But this sort of talk is mostly left to extremists. Cover everything? That can't be. Where would we go? Most people, and indeed most private and government sector organizations, entire civilizations and religions even, find handy ways to ignore or downplay that knowledge. I suggest you do the same. There it is. There's the illusion. There's the metaphor. <laughs> it's so heavy-handed as well. I just never got this dialogue, and that's why I don't remember it. I didn't remember it. I never got this bit. This is the first time I've seen this dialogue. Yeah, it's super heavy-handed as well. Because, you know, most people, most private and government sectors ignore, find a way to ignore. They don't really. They prepare for it, but they no, at least don't spread the knowledge so that people can pretend that it's not there. Off we go. You see the hanged man's mouth open. Off we go into the wild pale yonder. One and all. She closes her eyes. They say pale is death, but for the universe. Why should we just leave and leave and the world get left behind? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if we can't have it, nobody can, says our inland empire. Let's return to reality, please. Yes, sweet reality. She stomps her foot. But before we do, tell me, detective, is this the first time you're hearing this? Do you really not remember anything? I'm getting a sense of who I am, but no, I, I didn't know this. Beyond curious. Tell me, what do you think of the pale? I'm worried. I have to say, it doesn't sound very liberal to me. Mm-hmm. Her eyes tense. Crow's feet radiate from them. She observes you, your bloodshot eyes and swollen face. You really didn't know. This does not spell good for the investigation, detective. If you don't know even this, then... She stops mid-sentence. This investigation will be my masterpiece. The one they remember me by, I promise. I hope so. I truly do. If I may suggest, hold on to your colleague, Kitsuragi. I ran a check on him and he is very competent. In the meanwhile, you have me. I will assist you in any way I can, even if we have to do it one basic term at a time. She gives you a slight bow. That's all for now. Glad to have been of assistance. The little that I know. Anything else? No, thank you. That's all for now. And that's all for this episode as well, because we're out of time. So for right now, I'm Colonel RPG, and this has been Disco Elysium. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you did, go ahead and leave a comment, like the video. But above all, thank you so much for watching, and I hope I'll see you next episode. Bye-bye.